Hey, fearsome friends. We're getting disturbingly spooky tonight. From Hindu witches, drunk ghosts, and footsteps in the attic. I'll always believe what people say they believe to have experienced. So sit back, relax, and get cosy, comfy, warm. Because it's time to let your nightmares in. I used to study in Dr. Graham's home, which is situated in Kalimpong, India, and was established in 1900, which makes it one of the oldest schools in India. It was built by the Scottish during the British Raj and was for the underprivileged children. I was a boarder far away from home and was unfortunately diagnosed with pneumonia during the summer holidays of 2009. During that time, there were no students in the school, just the sponsored kids. I was always a private kid and wasn't allowed to go home for the holidays because swine flu was on the rise in India at that time and I already had pneumonia. So it was just me and a senior girl in the hospital. She had fever and wasn't allowed to go home either. And since there was no one in the hospital except us and the nurses, I was told to sleep in the girl's dormitory. She was really cheerful and humble, but after a couple of days she didn't really speak and would just sleep a lot. But then one night at around 11pm, she woke me up, asking me to come with her to the washroom and wait for her. So I got up and waited outside, but she took a very long time and didn't come out. The nurses would do the rounds at night, and they found me standing outside the girl's washroom. I told them I was waiting for Raisha, but she was taking such a long time. So the nurse went inside, but there was no one in there. I was shocked. The head nurse thought I was being naughty and took me to the dormitory, but to my disbelief, Raisha was fast asleep in bed. I started crying as I was so scared. The nurse checked my temperature and it was 103 but it had been normal before I'd gone to sleep earlier. I kept crying and didn't want to sleep there anymore, so the nurse took me to the nurse's room where I slept with her that night. That was the first time something paranormal had ever happened to me. The following day I asked Raisha why she'd pranked me, hoping that's all it was, but she said that she hadn't and actually got a little bit angry with me. A couple of days passed and I was still sleeping with nurses, when one night I had to go to the washroom really badly. I tried to wake the nurse up, but she wouldn't wake up. The boys' washroom was near the girls, and I was terrified to go alone, but I had to, because I was so desperate. So I went and did my business, but as soon as I came out, Raisha was standing right in front of my door, with a horrible smile on her face. A smile I will never forget. I froze and couldn't speak. Tears ran down my cheeks, and I swear I couldn't breathe. This had never happened to me before. She spoke to me, but I couldn't understand what she was saying, as she was speaking in a different language. I collapsed, and I don't remember anything after that. I woke up the next morning with nurses surrounding me, along with Raisha. I started crying when I saw her, I was so scared, and I told the head nurse everything, but no one believed me. Who would believe a nine-year-old everyone thought was hallucinating, as they thought I'd slipped and fallen in the washroom? But Raisha looked at me with eyes that told me she knew what had happened. A couple of days later, I thought everything was normal again, but that night I was really sick and was puking a lot. I couldn't sleep and it was late at night. I wanted to eat because of the puking, so the sister took me to the kitchen to get something. However, while we were coming down the stairs, the sister took me along with her to check on Raisha, and this time she was in her bed, sitting upright and facing the wall and giggling. Nurse called out to her and she looked back, and that's when she saw that she chewed her own lip and was bleeding heavily. The nurse grabbed me tightly as I started crying, 
and Raisha started speaking in a different language again. It wasn't Nepali, English or Hindi, but was something completely different. I started crying when she suddenly came running towards us, standing in front of us and laughing and crying herself. The head nurse screamed and everyone came running downstairs, where they could see what was happening. I had seen she was bleeding badly and smelt terrible. The nurses had to tie her up because she was spitting everywhere violently and still speaking in a different language. The school pastor was called but he hadn't seen anything like it before. I was sent home the next day and the nurses told everything to my dad. He was angry but he didn't say anything. I was taken to a temple where the pundit, a Hindu priest, blessed me. I recovered from my pneumonia and went back to school. I was called to the principal's office before assembly and was told not to tell what happened to anybody due to the school reputation. That day in assembly I also found out that Raisha had passed away. We prayed for her. That was the first experience of my life, but not the last. Later on I also found out that a girl during the British period was abused by the nurses and locked up in the bathroom in the hospital. She had eaten her fingers and her lips due to starvation. I think something tried to contact my boyfriend and I, disguised as someone else through our dreams. So to start off, I, a 19 year old female, have always believed a spirit has attached itself to me since I was very young, because my parents decided to mess with a Ouija board when I was a baby. Or maybe there has simply been an entity in each house and or apartment that I've ever lived in growing up. I just usually assume it's me that it's attached to. I have numerous stories on the topic that I won't go into for the sake that this story is about my boyfriend, a 20 year old male, and his weirdly related dreams. But I don't know if this entity is mine or something else entirely. I've always believed that whatever my spirit may be, it has always been a fairly nice one, or at least nice enough not to hurt me. I have never really felt in harm's way, and usually my experiences are a simple bump in the night. My TV or video game consoles turning themselves on or off, the sound of someone walking around and no one being there, catching a glimpse of someone despite no one being there, hearing a voice call out to me or a door opening on its own, etc. I do find myself getting the heebie-jeebies when these things happen. But at the same time, I've gotten rather accustomed to seeing and hearing these things take place. However, as I've said, this isn't about my other ghost stories. This is far more than I've ever experienced, and something, quite frankly, I would rather not ever experience again. So six months ago, I moved into a new apartment for a fresh start. I got into the habit fairly quickly of once again living day to day, hearing my ghost friend. My boyfriend, who lives in his own home, eventually started coming over more and more, spending the night as most couples would do, and everything seemed fine, as nothing ever really set him off. Until the other night, that is. Now I had to be up fairly early for my job, but for some reason, I just couldn't fall asleep, or stay asleep no matter how hard I tried. This was never unusual, of course as I always had trouble falling asleep as a young girl, and this followed suit well into my young adult years, so of course this night was no different. I awoke around 5.30 in the morning for no apparent reason. I had been trying to fall back to sleep, but to no avail. Then suddenly at around 5.48, I checked the time on my phone afterwards. My boyfriend started to scream in his sleep, and when I say scream, I mean a blood-chilling scream. I felt my heart stop and my blood go absolutely cold. I was in such a panic as I shot up and reached over to grab onto him, and as soon as I did he called out my name, 
still in a screaming panic. I shook him as I pleaded his name, begging him to wake up, and he let out one last final scream as his eyes snapped open, immediately allowing tears to escape as he clung to me. Both of our hearts raced, and it took about an hour and a half to even begin to calm him down and ask him what was wrong, and he said, I had a bad dream. Do you want to talk about it? I asked, not really thinking much of it. I had originally assumed that it was a silly bad dream, like dreams of your significant other dying on you or something, only for you to wake up and realise that they are in fact still alive. But I was very wrong. He nodded and told me what had actually happened. He was alone in an attic, although he couldn't pinpoint where or why he was inside one. All he knew was he needed to look for something. But again, as to what that something was, he had no idea. He started to look around in some boxes, but came up empty in each one. He decided he was going to give up and just go back downstairs. But when he turned around, he came face to face with his dead grandmother. At this point in the story, I immediately got chills, and the air felt much cooler, despite me always keeping my home at 85 degrees. I could not stop shaking for what seemed like forever. His grandma didn't say a single word, but just stared at him for a few seconds, and that's when he began to scream. My boyfriend's grandmother had been gone for many years at this point from cancer, and he said she was almost exactly as he had remembered her when she passed. Almost. She was extremely pale for what she was supposed to be. It looked like her, but it didn't feel like her, he described to me. He said that her energy was extremely off, and she was a very religious person, so she wouldn't try to contact him just to scare him. He also explained that he has had a few bad nightmares every year, but nothing that ever set him off this badly before. I had tossed up the theory of astral projection, and maybe some entity was trying to enter him, and that's why they tasked him of finding an object, but hadn't expected him to turn around. We discussed a few other theories, but there was nothing I could find online to back them up. Everything on seeing your dead loved ones was supposed to be a good omen, but this definitely felt like a bad one. The dream didn't even happen to me, but any time I tried to talk to him about it, on top of the chills I would cry any time I opened my mouth. We tried to go on with our day. I even had gone so far as to have a friend come and bless us, and my boyfriend said he felt a little better about the whole situation. However, that night I had a dream that I believe correlated with the dream my boyfriend had had. My dreams always take place either in my dad's old home or my mum's old home, but this one took place right in my own bedroom at my new apartment. We were laying in bed, talking about something I couldn't quite remember, a bunch of gibberish that probably didn't make sense because it was a dream, when I heard a girl's voice call out to us. Who's there? I asked to the room. It's me, silly, the girl replied, and an arm popped out from underneath my bed, then another one, and she wiggled them around at me, laughing. I leaned over my bed to get a better look, when her arms popped back under the bed and she flew up the wall from under the other side. I was able to wake myself up as soon as she did that, and told my boyfriend about it but it was all too freaky. At this point, I'm not quite sure what the entity was, or why it came to my boyfriend, and possibly me in a dream, or what it even wanted to begin with. But I have thought about it every day since, and I'm always on guard. So we were both sober at the time of the incident, and I was at home with my girlfriend. I 23 and she 21, and nobody else was home. A bit of background about me. I take weed and psychedelics, only, and I'm mentally stable, 
with never having an episode or anything weird happen to me. I love psychedelic effects and feelings, but I can very easily identify drug versus reality. The last trip I had was a year and a half from this happening, and I never felt any lingering effects. I truly believe this happened, and had never heard voices or seen shadow people etc. A normal Joe. Our living room is a large open concept, connected to the kitchen. Imagine an eight foot long and a four and a half foot high bar, raised counter, and on the opposite side there is about a six inch lower counter with a double sink. Behind that is the back counter, same as the bar left to right, only six inches lower, and behind that was an outside wall. The microwave and cabinets are at eye level, and to the left another wall, the same wall the TV is on, and to the right a refrigerator. Further right is the dining room out of sight from our sitting location, and from the couch you can see the entire kitchen, the raised bar counter first, then you can see the top of the sink and the back wall, fridge etc. We were sitting facing the kitchen's raised countertop, but turned 35-ish degrees left facing the TV. It's on the left wall in the living room, 15 feet from centre of kitchen. Now this happened a month ago, it lasted about two seconds and it was between 4 and 8 p.m. I heard a tearing sound, identical to a piece of paper tearing. It was loud, but not crazy like five pieces being ripped at once, and it caused me to turn and look in the direction of where it came from. My quick motion made my girlfriend look too, and just above the sink, about one foot suspended above, I could see a wavy heat-like blur. It looked to be 14 to 18 inches tall, and 4 to 8 inches wide, and had depth, but was so weird looking I have no clue. It was clear, but it made the cabinet and microwave behind it unrecognisable, due to the distortion. It appeared out of nowhere, and the sound was clearly coming from it. I wish I could describe it better, but it's like seeing new technology. It made no sense to my mind, how or what it was. Like an invisibility cloak in a movie, but way, way too real. The next thing that happened was an item falling from the tear. That's the only way I can describe it. It looked like a sheet of white printer paper in a helix shape, but half untwisted. It wasn't curled up, but it wasn't flat either. It was a shape, like the tear. My mind couldn't recognise it all. It was suspended for less than a quarter of a second, and began to fall into the kitchen area, just like a piece of paper would. Semi-floating, but heading towards the lower cabinet behind the sink. By the time the paper fell from view, into the sink or behind it, the tear and heat blur dissipated into clarity again, but I was now much more focused on the moving item. In two seconds it made the tear sound, appeared, dropped this white item and then was gone. We looked at each other in complete shock, and without saying a word rushed into the kitchen to see what had just fallen. But the only thing on the counter was a house plant with small green leaves, the sink was empty, the floor was clear, and in between the counter and fridge was clean. Nothing. We both looked and looked and found absolutely nothing. I broke down because I was so sure I'd seen something and heard it, and there now was nothing I could find as evidence. It left me with an entirely new feeling I've never felt before. My hair was standing, adrenaline was rushing, I felt panic and utter disappointment, disbelief, horror, and most of all like I was a pilgrim from 1800, seeing a nuclear power plant. Ununderstandable. I've never heard or seen any stories like this, as I googled and googled and found nothing. But we both saw it, and can't understand it. What could this be? For context, I had a long-distance best friend, who was graduating, 
and he invited me to come see it. He paid for my airfare and everything, so of course I said yes. I went to South Carolina and we had a great time. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, and after a week I went back to my home in Florida. The day I got there I was exhausted, so I went to sleep, but was hit badly with night terrors. I thought it was just my brain handling stress, but I kept having the same dream every night for two weeks. In the dream I had to fight an eleven foot tall wendigo to get to my mother and save her. This terrifying beast kept attacking me, and my loved ones, and every time it killed me I was revived in a different location, similar to dying in a video game. But every slash felt painfully real, and eventually I would kill it and wake up. After two weeks from having this dream, I was getting tired of this thing haunting my sleep, so I decided to just stay up and focus on my writing. It had been only a day without sleep and I was writing in the kitchen, like I always did, and I was so immersed that I almost missed it. But I saw a dark shadow from the corner of my eye. I instinctively turned to look at it and was met by the same eleven foot tall wendigo from my dreams, staring at me in the middle of my kitchen. I immediately said, You need to get the hell out of here. Go away. I watched it narrow its eyes before disappearing. I was freaked out, so I looked up some protection spells, and after some trial and error, I had made a herb mixture to ward it off. From that night on, I didn't hear or see anything else. It was a terrifying experience, though. It was a rainy night when my uncle was returning home from Siliguri, India, to Darjeeling, with chicken for the next day. He was told to light an incense stick in his car while coming back, because carrying raw meat at night attracts negative energy, but he didn't because he didn't believe in such superstitions. He was five kilometres away from home, and he didn't feel right that day. He felt like someone was with him as he came across Ava Art Gallery and spotted a lady in her thirties, who he described as being the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen in his life. She was wearing a sari, blue in colour, and it was long and covered her feet. She was also wearing a shawl which covered her body and was taking shade under a departmental store which was closed. She waved at him for a lift, but he didn't stop, since he was in a hurry. He then reached the Vodafone offices where he usually parked his car, and took out his umbrella and the bag of raw chicken. And as he was walking up to his house, he spotted the same woman from before, walking in a distance in front of him. He shivered, took out a cigarette, lit it up and started walking again, feeling scared and very desperate to get home. He couldn't see the woman, who was only about twenty feet away, as she had now disappeared into thin air. He was really close to home as he took a couple of puffs and then threw away the cigarette, and as soon as he started climbing the stairs, he saw the woman again, but this time she was only six feet away from him. He froze and waited for her to reach the top, but it felt like the stairs were never ending. He walked slowly behind her up the same stairs that he walked every day, but this time they felt very long. She was still in front of him, and after an hour, he finally reached the top as she was walking around the corner. He reached his home and took one last look at her, but when he looked down, he could see that her feet were backwards. He was scared now, but relieved he'd made it home. Shocked at what he'd just seen, he couldn't sleep, and the next day he had fever and had to be admitted to the hospital. His condition became worse day by day, and he hardly slept. He used to tell my dad that the woman was going to take him away, and he said that she would come in his dreams. He told us what happened when he was in his hospital bed. 
It was November the 20th, 2011, and I was 10 years old. He gave me 1,000 rupees as I was returning to school and told me to study well. But the next day I got a call from my dad, who told me that my uncle had passed away. This happened many years ago when my family moved into an old farmhouse. I was about three at the time. The house was so old that the walls were hand-split boards, covered by newspaper, hessian and layers of wallpaper and paint. My father was a skeptic and made fun of any belief in the paranormal, so my mother never mentioned anything on her side of the family until I was in my twenties. So here I am now, many years later, having been brought up to be sceptical about anything paranormal, but knowing there are a lot of things that I can't explain. And one of the many is my lady in black. As a three-year-old, shortly after we moved into the old house, I suddenly developed an imaginary friend. I'd never had an imaginary friend before, apparently, but my mum just accepted this as a passing phase children go through. But unlike most children, however, my friend was apparently an elderly woman in a long black dress, white hair, in a high bun, with a rather distinctive white horse brooch at the centre of the collar of the high neck. I always referred to her as my lady in black. Nothing much there, I suppose. A lot of children have imaginary friends. But where it gets a little weird is as follows. When I was about four, my mother was frantically looking for me in the house. I was ill and supposed to stay in bed, but she couldn't find me. She even started checking under the beds and in the wardrobes. She was about to leave the house to look for me, when she looked out at a kitchen window, and there I was up at the paddock with my father, filling the water trough. About thirty minutes later I came in. Apparently I stopped at the door of the kitchen, cocked my head to one side and looked up, and then looked at her and asked her why she was looking in the wardrobes for me when I was with my father. I then looked up again and back to my mum and said, I'm sorry I scared you. My mum asked me how I knew she was looking for me, and I told her. The lady in black told me you were worried. And then I named places she had looked for me and said, but you looked out of the kitchen window and saw me with Dad. I also remember telling my mum that my lady in black came to say goodnight to me and tucked me in. All I remember of this is a nice comforting feeling, but I could hear my mother and father talking in the living room. I found out years later that my sister would get visits too. However, she is highly religious now, and refers to our old home as demon-possessed, and that I was possessed as a child. She got a bit drunk one night and told me tales that I had forgotten, but checked with her other family members that confirmed them. I would write off the one about vibrating floorboards that my sister used to prove I was a demon possessed. However, when I asked my skeptic father about it, he just says he doesn't want to talk about anything weird that happened in the house. The story goes that at times I would be in the living room playing, and the floorboards would start vibrating. Any person in the room could feel it through their shoes. However, if you got within a metre radius of where I was sitting, they would not be. If you stood with one foot within that radius and one outside, you could feel the vibrations through the foot farthest away from me. I honestly don't remember any of this. I do remember family members at time walking around me, and I remember asking my sister if she was doing the hokey pokey, because it was annoying me, but I don't remember it being raised with me at the time. As I got older, I stopped talking about my lady in black openly, because my father didn't like it. But I still would acknowledge her presence to my mother, who was much more open to these things. When I was about eight, my father started renovating the inside of the house and removing the old hand-split boards off the walls. 
My mum told me later that while removing the walls, an old photograph fell out, and it was a picture of an elderly woman. White hair in a high bun, dressed in a long high-necked black gown, and at her neck was a white brooch. Almost exactly as I had described my imaginary friend in the years before. My description of her never changed, and I'd even drawn pictures of her. My skeptic father passed it off as a coincidence, as I had always mentioned a white horse brooch, so according to my mum he got out a magnifying glass to look closer at the brooch. He then tossed the photo and magnifying glass down, swore and left the house. My mother then looked at the photo with the magnifying glass, and on closer examination it showed that it was a white horse facing the way I said it would. When my dad came back in, he told my mum that it was a coincidence. When my father left for his afternoon shift, my mother got out all her old family photos, some from the same era, and mixed the photo from the wall in among them. She laid them out on the kitchen table before I came home from school. And when I did, I saw the photos on the table and immediately picked up the picture and asked what her name was because this was my lady in black. I remember that because I was so excited to see the picture and find out who she was. My lady in black didn't come around as much after that. I don't know if I got too old or if opening the wall and finding the photo released her in some way. I was lead bartender at a pool hall on the outskirts of New Orleans for about 10 years. Our main patrons were older men who mostly lived alone, and we were the spot they'd like to come to socialise. Many came for long hours every day, whether they played pool that particular day or not, and over the years many of these men passed away, a few even dying in the building. We had a few fatal heart attacks and a stroke victim who passed before the EMTs could get there. Sadly this bar was the last place many of these men had felt happy and needed in their lives, which I think may have drawn some of them back after passing. Also bars have long been rumoured to be favourite hangouts for earthbound spirits who don't realise they're dead and are craving one more drink or smoke, or possibly a game of pool in this case. There was definite activity in the bar and pool hall, though it was on and off. A male voice would loudly say my name directly in my ear, and I'd feel a blast of warm air, as if it had breath, when I was nowhere near any living person. At the beginning of my shift, the bar was usually empty, so I would go into the office to count the money in the gaming safe. I always kept the camera feeds up on the monitor, just in case someone came in. And I can't tell you how many times I would look at the monitor and see someone sitting at the bar, waiting for service, even though I hadn't heard the door chime. I'd head out to the bar, only for it to be empty, and more often than not it was a really pale white guy, with dark hair, white tee and a black jacket. One day my first customer of the shift came in and sat in the seat that the pasty guy had been in on the camera feed about an hour or two before. But I didn't say anything, not wanting to sound crazy. I was behind the bar, and about ten feet from the customer, when he screamed like a little girl and jumped up so fast that he sent his chair flying backwards. He swore up and down that someone had grabbed his leg and squeezed. He said he could feel the individual fingers and everything and we were the only two people in the bar. He left immediately, still shaking. I also saw people in my peripheral that weren't there when I turned towards them, and many times I would be serving drinks and call out, I'll be right with you as soon as I finish here, before turning to see no one there. I thought it might just be me seeing things, but it literally never happened anywhere else except at work and several times customers remarked that they could have sworn they had seen someone who had just been standing there as well. Now to get behind the bar, you had to go to the end farthest from the entrance, where a section of the bar lifted up like a door. 
To the right was where the bartending happened. But to the left was a hallway that had the office and rooms with the safes, and extra liquor bottles, etc. Basically everything down that hallway had a lot of value, and the bartenders were expected to make sure that no one came behind the bar or gained access to the hallway. But I always saw people walking back there, and not from my peripheral vision either. These people looked very solid and real. I could easily describe their skin, hair colour and outfits, the whole shebang. I would go running back there, check all three rooms down the hallway, and not find a soul, even though the only way out would have been to pass me. This happened all the time, whether I was slow or busy, and it actually seemed to happen more when the bar was packed. My regulars were very familiar with this routine, and teased me about it unmercifully. However, word of this did cause my co-workers to begin sharing their own experiences, so I was able to get some confirmation at least. The activity which had always been intermittent got really intense for almost two months. Then all of a sudden everything stopped. The guy who got his leg grabbed and a few other regulars who had witnessed some things commented on it, and so did my co-workers. No more chasing shadows or disappearing customers. It was great. However, a few months after the activity stopped at the bar, I was taking a shower at home, when I noticed that the far right corner of my shower seemed very dim. I peeked my head out to make sure none of our three bathroom bulbs had burned out, and they were all shining away. I shrugged it off, even though I had a slightly unsettling feeling but it was nothing major. This continued for several weeks, although not every day, and the feeling of unease grew and grew. It wasn't always dim over there, but when it was, I swear I could feel it before even looking. The shower is my happy place, and I hated this newfound creepiness invading it. I tried to think of every possible explanation, seasonal changing of the angle of sunlight, weather or cloud condition, my mental state, you name it. However, I had lived there for over five years at this point, and had never seen anything remotely like this. I have one tiny bathroom window, with thickly frosted glass and a screen, so it has never really affected the lighting in the bathroom, and it's angled away from the shower. As time went on, the dimness grew more pronounced. It now looked more like a diffused shadowy mist, rather than a dim spot. The feeling of unease began to change too. I started feeling like something was watching me while I showered, and found myself refusing to close my eyes or turn around when showering, and seriously considered how long I could go between showers before it became noticeable. I had been trying to convince myself that it was all some kind of stress-induced psychosomatic weird thing my brain was doing, or a strange type of vision anomaly, but I was unsuccessful. I finally accepted that there was actually something there, watching me at my most vulnerable, and enough was enough. I contacted a friend and told him a little of what I'd felt, and expressed my desire to do a house cleansing. I didn't want to do it alone though, so he agreed to come over in two days. Feeling better about the whole situation, I had a slightly smug air as I started my shower that night, and lo and behold, there was no darkness, no shadows, and no weird feelings. Yes, maybe I had been tripping after all, so to speak. I was under the water with my eyes, closed, enjoying the hell out of my bright, peaceful shower, when a shock of alarm jolted through me. It felt like someone was standing right there in front of me, and staring at me hard. And when I opened my eyes, the shadow was there, and looked more different than ever before. It was much darker, and there was a clearly visible oval egg-shaped centre of deeper darkness in the middle of the shadows, although I could still see through it. The top of it was slightly lower than my upper chest. I'm just under five foot and it didn't have hard edges, just kind of diffused out to a lighter shadow. 
The oval was roughly three feet from top to bottom, and about a foot and a half wide. I stood frozen, just staring at it for a few seconds. It was like my brain was having trouble processing what I was seeing. Then my brain started working again, and I jumped out of the shower stark naked and half rinsed, ran through the house dripping shampoo and water everywhere, yelling what the hell over and over again. It's pretty freaking hilarious to picture it now, but at the time I was terrified. I skipped my shower the next day. When my friend arrived the day after, I frantically filled him in on what had happened the night we agreed to do the cleansing, although I did leave out the part about running around naked and yelling, and he had this little smirk on his face. I asked him if he believed me and he said, I believe you believe that you saw something. Slightly patronising, but understandable. Besides, I thought having a sceptic on hand could be a good thing. So I started burning herbs on charcoal and calling in protection. We began in the living room. As soon as I called for protection, my friend jumped and gasped, eyes popping out of his face. He took a few steps back and sat on the couch. He was very pale and had his ankles tightly crossed, and his hands clasped firmly in his lap, elbows tucked in, sitting very straight. And although he didn't know this, he had automatically assumed a pose recommended to close off your energy or aura. The poor guy looked horrified. He claimed that as soon as I called for protection, a bone-chilling blast of frigid air went straight through his entire body. I was standing right in front of him at the time, and he was amazed that I didn't feel anything. He was completely freaked out. I convinced him that finishing the cleansing was important, after experiencing something like that, so he bravely got up and helped me cleanse my place. After we were through, I decided to let the herbs finish burning out in the shower. When I went to the shower, which we had just spent a lot of time in, smoking it out with herbs, there was a single fat black fly lying dead on its back, right in the corner, where the shadow liked to hang out. We were both absolutely certain it wasn't there a few minutes before, while I realised flies get into the house, the timing and placement were freaky as hell. I've been here seven to eight years now, and that was the first, last and only time I've ever found one of those big black corpse flies in my apartment. I haven't had any issues with shadows in my shower since, and to this day my friend gets noticeably freaked out when I bring up the cleansing, so I like to do it when we're drinking and his expressions are even funnier than usual. But I don't think it was a shadow person or demon, or anything like that. I think it was a ghost without the energy to fully manifest, but who still liked to peep on twenty-something females whilst they were showering. I never saw or felt it anywhere or any time else, while I was in my place. I also think it most likely was the pasty guy who liked to mess with me at work, who just eventually followed me home. But who knows? He's long gone now, probably lurking in the corner of some other poor woman's shower. This is my husband's story, and it has always creeped us out. The first few times he told it to me, I told him he just probably had a weird dream, but he is insistent that this was not a dream. We have searched the web many a night, trying to find an explanation or similar story, but there's nothing. So tonight I asked him to tell me the story again. I'll put it on Reddit, and we'll see if anyone has experienced something similar. I don't know why we didn't do this earlier, to be honest. Now the story is told by my husband. I spent most of 2015 in Europe. For two months I was working at a healing centre in Kilkenny, Ireland. And one night, after the owner and I had watched a movie, we both went to our own bedrooms to get some sleep. I got ready for bed, laid down, plugged my phone in and saw it was 10.08pm. 
I laid on the bed on my back facing the ceiling and closed my eyes and almost immediately something made me want to open them again. The moment I did though, both my legs were lifted upwards towards the ceiling. Then I was dragged by my feet to the foot of the bed and straight off onto the floor. I couldn't feel it when I hit the floor. Then I was dragged over to the wall, with my legs still lifted upwards towards the ceiling and were now flush with the wall. I quickly realised I wasn't in control of my body, and as I stood up, turned around and faced the door leading to the hall, my body walked itself down the hall, very slowly, with my arms at my side. I couldn't talk or move, and my body itself could feel that I was being moved like a puppet. I walked all the way downstairs, through the kitchen and dining room, and back into the living room, where I had just been watching a movie. I sat down on the couch, but it didn't sink in that I was sat more like a robot on the edge of the couch, with my arms limp at my sides. I was facing the fireplace, and was just staring straight forward for about two minutes. While I sat there I couldn't speak or move, but my mind was racing with questions and fear about what was going on. Now I don't know exactly how to say this next bit, but here goes. As I was sitting there, my body felt like it wasn't still. Like I could feel my body slightly shifting in place as I was just sitting there. And after two or so minutes of this, I got up and stared straight ahead for a moment, then retraced my steps slowly back through the dining room and kitchen, back up the stairs, through the hall and back into my bedroom. I laid down on my bed, still not feeling at all in control of my body, and closed my eyes. However, when I opened them again, I had regained full control of my body, and everything was fine. I figured I had dreamed the whole thing, and when I looked at my clock, expecting it to be the middle of the night, which would further justify my assumption that it was all just a dream, it was only 10.14pm. If anyone has had a similar experience, we would really love to hear it. Just for context, I got the second dose of Moderna's COVID vaccine, and I had some major symptoms. Fever, chills, major fatigue and body aches, and they kicked in around 1am. As I began to sleep around 1, 1.20am, I felt so surreal, like I was entering a different plane of existence, yet that which resembled reality as we know to be. I was surrounded by kind, warm and ethnically diverse people, who all tried to console the fever chills and pain I was feeling in person. I think this was just my still mostly conscious brain, processing the literal warmth of my blanket and throw, in contrast to how cold I felt. This much made sense, and I can't quite remember what happened afterwards. However, I do recollect a vivid memory of debating the meaning of what it meant to truly be, with this void-like shadowy entity. A shadow would imply darkness, thus fear but it wasn't fear I felt, but benevolence. Almost like whatever this mental construct was, approved my view on what I consider real, and what simply is. It wasn't exactly a debate though, it felt as if I was the only one talking, but I sensed vague gestures of approval from the other end. Nothing visual about this shadowy thing was clear, but I remember asking, What's the purpose of one's death if life itself had no meaning? Shouldn't there simply be no such thing as death, but only everlasting existence if there truly is no meaning to any of this? I can't quite put this into words as it was more of a feeling than a tangible statement, but I thought to myself, existence as I know it is just a search for an already known truth we all share and that it's our superficial ways that hinder us finding something so obvious. 
something became so clear to me then, that I was forced to wake up, and the single thought I had was, how did I not know something so obvious as the fact that death is not an answer to what is the purpose of life, nor is it meant to be something to fear? Instead I think that only when we die can we learn the true meaning of life, and everything else is just a pursuit to find this answer. I hope I'm wrong, and I hope there's more to us than just trying to figure out exactly why we are. I have no idea what prompted me to think and experience any of this, nor did I recollect any experience with a shadow entity until I began to deeply think about it. Currently it is 6.31am, and I've spent about 45 minutes trying to put together anything I can remember. To clarify, I don't think this was a religious experience, although I do consider myself agnostic, therefore a believer in some force of being much beyond that I can comprehend. But instead I think this was just a candid talk I had with what I assumed to be my inner subconscious, maybe something like a lucid dream, as I don't think I fully entered a deep sleep. Before I start my story, I want you guys to know that I am Indian Nepalese, and most of us are Hindus, and according to tradition, when we die we are set on fire. The following story happened to my brother last year. Energetic, confident and very cheerful, he passed his tenth class and scored very good marks, so our parents got him a motorcycle. He would go for long rides and this incident happened to him in November 2020, when he went for a ride to Kalimpong, India. It's a three-hour ride from our home in Darjeeling, and he left home at 10am. Just like every day, my mum would ask him to be home before dark, but he was always late. This one particular night on his way back, he was crossing the Tista Bridge, and it was 8pm. He knew he was going to get a scolding from Mum. It was pitch black out, and cold thick forests surrounded him. His friends were up ahead, and when he was about to reach Peshok, he saw a woman in her late thirties wearing Kubandi Cholo, which is traditional Nepali women's clothing, and she was waving her hand for a lift. He stopped for her and later described her as being the most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his life. She had long hair and the most gorgeous eyes. She asked him if he could give her a lift to Upper Peshok, but he wondered what she was doing out at that time of night, in the middle of nowhere. She told him that she had come to visit a relative in the nearby village, so he gave her a lift to Upper Peshok. However, she asked him to stop, still in the middle of nowhere, and told him that her home was in the village. As she walked away, my brother looked at her, and something was off. She was walking in a very odd manner. His friends were waiting for him and asked why he'd gotten to them late. He told them that he'd given a woman a lift, and his friends asked him where he'd dropped her off. He told them Upper Peshok Forest, as she said there was a village there, but his friends told him that there is no village near Upper Peshok Forest. They all decided it was getting late, so all made their way home for the night. Once home my mum scolded him as expected, and he told me this story just before going to sleep. I'd wondered about the clothes he'd said she was wearing, as Chobondi Cholo is only really worn for special occasions and was particularly worn throughout the sixties. But then he told me that he'd met the same woman in Darjeeling today, that he'd been out with her, and it had been happening for a while. In fact, he went out every day. Our mum knew about this girl, but he hadn't told her everything, as he knew she would scold him for dating an older woman. After a while, my brother began to become physically weak, to the point where we could see his bones. My mum fed him a lot, 
and he also ate a lot, but despite this he just grew weaker and weaker. We took him to the doctors, but there was no progress. He was still seeing this woman, and one day my mum took my brother to the local priest. After being with the priest for only five minutes, he told my mum that my brother had met a kitschkanya, which is a type of witch, and my brother was going to die if we didn't do something immediately. My brother was now scared, as he had only just met her before going there. He told my brother to meet her again, and gave him a roll of thread to tie on her wherever he could, without her noticing. So he met up with her in her neighbourhood at night, and me and my mum were looking out at him from a window. But all we could see was my brother talking to thin air. He came back in and was absolutely terrified. He tied the thread and left it on the ground, and he'd noticed that the woman's feet were backwards. I could tell he was petrified from looking at him. And the next morning we followed the thread. A lot of people had noticed it. It went up to the upper Peshok River, where us Hindus would usually burn corpses, and the thread ended there. It was tied to a bone which was when my brother freaked out. We took the bone to the priest, who then said that the woman had committed suicide. Then the priest had to do the burning ceremony again. That same day my brother got really sick, but then began to get better and is really healthy again. I wonder what would have happened if my mother hadn't gone to the priest. My brother still sees her in his dreams and says that she doesn't say anything, but just looks at him as if she's waiting for him. Here I am, twelve years after the events of Longford Drive, having nightmares again, and this time I need someone to believe me. I am twenty-eight now, and no one believes fifteen and sixteen-year-olds after all. Overdramatic, attention-seeking, over-imagination, mental illness? Should we take her to a doctor? Yes and he said it was just the teenage hormones. Ah, that's it. But this time I need someone to believe me. I was born in Fitzroy, Melbourne, Victoria, Australia in 1992. My brother was born in the same place in 97, and in 2001, before the towers in New York City fell, my family moved to the US. A few months later, the towers fell, and no more house, so we moved to Texas. For almost seven years we couldn't buy anywhere and had to rent. Once moved into our rental, one particular night my brother woke me up and was in a horrified state. There are red eyes in the corner of my room, he told me. No there isn't, you're having a nightmare. Leave me alone, I said groggily. I don't remember him leaving the room, but in the morning he wasn't there and I began to notice that he would avoid certain parts of the house. I just ignored it, but it went on for years, and he never mentioned the red eyes in the corner of his room again. Now we moved around a lot after that, when we were finally able to buy our own home, Longford Drive. It was an older house for the area, built in the early 1980s. The surrounding homes were in the 2000s range, and actually had vinyl flooring instead of old scratched up flooring that was light, and an ugly brown that looked like something out of the 1970s. I used to study every scratch and scrape on the floor, and would wonder, what happened there? Movers? Children? Dogs? Or something else? Regardless of the home's obvious bland and aged interior, it was at least our home. It was an early cookie cutter house though, and you could tell. Every main room was on the first floor, and on the second floor was a dominated media room with slanted ceilings for the roof and a huge walk-in attic. The attic was practically its own room, which I suppose my parents liked at the time due to their endless 80s furniture from Australia 
that for some reason they refused to part with. The most disgusting of all this furniture was a couch that had fishes on it. It was navy and yellow with detailed, multicoloured fish, and I don't recall when they finally got rid of it, but I'm glad they did. I'm glad they got rid of a lot of things when we left that house, to be honest. It took a few years, about five to be exact, to truly realise something wasn't right, and it all started the night before sophomore year of high school. My best friend Chelsea and I had practically grown up in that town, and had heard all the legends, laughed about them with our friends and boyfriends. But I guess that night we got brave and went to the local graveyard, that was at least 200 years old. We wanted to wander around it and take pictures on an old digital camera, which was actually new at the time. My friend Chelsea had claimed in the past that she could see spirits, but to this day I'm still not sure if I believe in all that. Even after what happened, logic is a bitch. Stumbling through this graveyard, I was laughing about something. Like a disrespectful, crappy teenager, we've all been there. Remember when you knew about death, but still didn't process that it could happen to you? Sometimes I'm still like that. But tell me, does it disappear with age? Anyway, Chelsea stopped laughing, and I looked back at her, because the silence stunned me. Now she was white, but unnaturally white at this moment. Her brown eyes looked black and were big. We need to leave, she said. What? We need to leave now, she said. She said she felt something was almost consuming her, just absolute dread and fear all inside her. There was no fight or flight, as it just felt broken. We just stared at each other like we were going to let whatever was about to happen, happen. Like we knew we weren't going home tonight, and had just accepted it. Chelsea broke. I watched her throw up her feet, as her body got further from me and more towards my little red mustang on the horizon. I don't know how, and I don't remember to be honest, but I ended up following her somehow, and was suddenly grabbing the door handle of my mustang, and once inside the feeling had at least faded a little. What did you see? I asked her. Nothing. But I felt... Let's go. I don't want to talk about it. Where's the camera? I handed her the camera and she flipped through the pictures I had taken. They were unusually blurry. And as she scrolled, I saw more and more bubble-looking things. Dust. That's what I immediately thought. But I knew nothing back then, I suppose. She stared intensely at some specific ones, then a look of rage came onto her face. She began deleting every picture furiously, and in that moment I thought only one thing. Drama Queen. I dropped Chelsea at home, and she said very little. I told her I would see her tomorrow at school, and she turned and said, Make sure you remove the SD card from the camera before you get home. Make sure all the photos are deleted. I ignored her and rolled my eyes after she had shut the door. I went home, laid out my first day of school clothes, and slept better than I had slept in a long time. But I think I slept better back then generally anyway, to be honest. Now I'm a serious insomniac with overactive REM cycles. Now my brother's room was right next to mine, and we slept with our doors open. Not sure why. I think it was a childhood habit that I wouldn't do today, and I don't think he does either. But I woke up at 6.15 that morning, to his panicked face wailing over me. To this day I have never in my life seen him so frightened. He was screaming, and my memory tells me crying and wailing too. Someone came into your room, he wailed. What? Someone is in your room, get up, he urged. He dragged me out of bed and ran to the door, still clinging to me. I was more awake now and threw on the light, but I saw nothing, except my tacky lilac room. He ran to the closet and flung the door open, but there was nothing, just my gross mid-2000s clothes. 
He ran to the bathroom, threw the door open there, put the shower curtain back, and still nothing. I looked at him, eyebrows raised, and almost laughed at him. His face turned paler. I, I woke up and there was a light in the hallway and I saw a man. He was older, had long beard, overalls and he was floating. He walked into your room. I saw it. It was not a dream. Don't look at me like that. I saw him. He began to tear up from frustration. My parents had woken up from all the commotion at this point and came in. He told them what happened, and this was the first exchange between them. He is on ADD medication. He's been having nightmares on this one. We should probably switch him, my dad said. Hmm, yes, but what if you saw Jesus, my brother wailed. My mother had noticed his face before stating this. It was a face of disbelief frustration, anger and horror. I'm sorry, brother. I didn't believe you either. My mind had already begun to favour the adult side of things and was too scared to admit there was sometimes things we didn't understand. I was too arrogant and egotistical. I'm sorry. He moved out of that room soon after and moved into the guest bedroom. I was now alone on that side of the house, which I enjoyed for a time. I rearranged my bedroom furniture, as I wanted to participate in a change as well. But one night, not long after, I woke up from the sound of footsteps in the hall. It was a small hall that only led to the now guest bedroom in my room, so I figured it was my dad checking in on me. My older brother had passed away when I was a baby, and my father never truly recovered. He would often come check on us while we slept as he just wanted to make sure we were still breathing, I guess. We were three out of four children left, and my older sister was married and lived far away, so we were always the babies that were left. More footsteps. It was a familiar sound, so I just rolled over and got more comfortable, preparing to fall back to sleep. I finally opened my eyes and looked over to my door to check the hallway, but nothing. Only the dim nightlight was staring back at me. He's walking around the kitchen for his late night glass of milk, I thought. I leaned to the right to peer past the hallway, but the kitchen light was off. I could still hear the footsteps. I was half awake and confused, so I closed my eyes and listened hard. Where the hell is that sound coming from? My eyes burst open as I realised and I slowly followed my lilac wall to my ceiling, which was unpainted. I froze and stared in disbelief. The footsteps were coming from the attic. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. I felt something was so wrong, and I had to stay awake in case it decided it wanted to consume me. Something was there with me. A week later, my parents complained about squirrels in the attic and suddenly I was sleeping well again. But then I heard it again. Even after the exterminator said the holes were patched and the squirrels were gone. Footsteps. And I got no sleep. The next day I went to the attic to figure this crap out for myself. So I opened the attic door and walked up the stairs. I worked out where my room would be under the attic floor and I found it. And as I walked as far as I could go, that's when I saw it. Nothing but insulation covering the entirety of where my room would be. That night was the first time I ever slept with my door closed, and it has not changed ever since. Footsteps again that night. Sometimes they sounded rushed, sometimes angry, sometimes sad. And they wouldn't come every night. Chelsea stopped sleeping over too. I complained to my parents about the squirrel noises every now and then, but the exterminator never found anything. No traces of anything. Rats, bugs, squirrels, nothing. My parents didn't believe me, and my brother would almost ignore me when I mentioned it. He didn't want to hear about it at all. Months went by, 
and finally I was able to convince Chelsea to come over for a bit to watch some TV. As she entered the house, we were gossiping about someone from school, and were laughing in the hallway when it happened again. She stopped and fixed her eyes on the stairs leading up to the media room. They were zigzag stairs, so they would go up, then it would be a flat landing, then the stairs would go the opposite direction, and there would be the media room. On the wall after the first set of stairs was a painting my mother had painted of a thunderstorm. Chelsea parted her lips and said in a whisper, There's someone standing at the top of your stairs. I can see them in the painting's reflection. Then she quickly left. I told my father that I'd suspected someone was up in the media room. So he searched everywhere, but nothing. I told him that Chelsea must have seen some shadows or something and scared herself. But then another few months went by, and I stopped going up to the media room. I used to secretly watch Family Guy up there when my parents were at work. But something was just wrong. It felt wrong being up there. Halloween came around and my brother and I were instructed to pull everything out of the attic. My brother ditched me halfway through though and I was pissed. I angrily started grabbing the boxes and was verbally venting to myself about his laziness. And as I started down the steps of the attic, I slowly started to lose my grip on one of the boxes. I paused to adjust, still livid. Then a shot of air blew past from behind my head and right next to my ear. I watched as a few strands of hairs reacted to the shot of air and flew out in front of my face and on my left side like someone had intentionally snuck up behind me and blown air on the back of my ear in an attempt to scare me. Except I was the only person there. I was venting about it after all, and I knew where my brother was. He was downstairs playing Call of Duty with his stupid friends. Dad was in his room watching Judge Judy, and Mum was away on a three-day trip. She was a flight attendant and was in Seattle six states away. I watched my hair fall back to the side of my face, and I dropped the boxes and let out a scream. I don't think I have yet to top. Twelve years later and I have never screamed like that again. I jumped and leapt down the remainder of the stairs and fell out of the attic door into the media room. My brother was already halfway up the stairs, thinking something horrible had happened, when I mumbled to him what had happened. A smile cracked on his face and he started laughing at me. Payback. For when I laughed at him the first time. Except this time he was the one in, the, in denial and disbelief. He was like me. He didn't want to believe it. Life was already too scary and overwhelming. Why believe that? My dad followed and I immediately started lying to his horrified face. I tripped, I told him. Oh, are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. Okay, we'll finish getting the Halloween stuff out. I turned to my brother and threatened to hurt him if he didn't finish helping me. He didn't. I waited for my mother to get home and explained that I wanted to do it with her and I would help her set up the Halloween stuff. She was delighted. The next few years I developed a habit of needing sleeping aids. Nothing major, just over-the-counter stuff. To this day I take about three sleep aid pills a night, and my husband doesn't understand how my body has built up that kind of tolerance, and he doesn't believe it either. If only he knew. The footsteps never stopped right up until the day we moved out. I then decided to finally start doing research into the house, and it turns out it was owned by an older couple before us, and the husband had hung himself in the attic, above my room. Financial problems, apparently. I told my parents, but they didn't believe me. I never told my brother, as I figured he wouldn't want to know. I still wonder if his nightmares ever stopped, as mine didn't. They have just gotten more complex with age. Taxes, career, break-ins, car wrecks, plane crashes, ghosts of the past. All of that and everything in between. We moved about a year later. 
One day I came home from university to our new home, my mother's dream home, and she asked me to go back to Longford Drive. Our old mail was apparently over there, so I drove up to the house and a shiver went down my spine. It started at my left ear. I had lived in a normal home for a few months now and hadn't realised how wrong Longford had felt. Something was really wrong with it. Had I let it in with the pictures that night at the cemetery? Had it always been there and I just hadn't noticed until my brother had his episode that morning? I don't know. And I don't want to know. Sometimes things are so frightening or traumatising that you feel like you don't need to know and you don't want to face it. The world is scary enough. I walked to the front door one last time and rang the doorbell. An older woman answered, and I smiled and told her I was there for the mail. She jumped and said, Oh, yes, here. She handed me a bundle of letters, magazines, and what I assumed was mostly junk. As an adult now, I can confirm that this is mostly what it was. I said thank you and started to turn away, when she stopped me. Did you used to live in this house? she asked. Yes, ma'am, for many years, I replied. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Did you ever have problems with critters getting into the attic? We had someone come and check, but they said there was no sign of anything up there. It almost sounds like footsteps at night. My granddaughter comes to stay and keeps complaining that it sounds like footsteps in the attic. Any of this sound familiar? I said it didn't, as she wouldn't have believed me anyway. But this time, I need someone to believe me. I often hear people telling me that they can't remember much of their dreams. But unlike others, I recall most of mine. When I was maybe seven or eight years old, I had this dream. I was in a marketplace, running and lost. It wasn't my hometown or anywhere that I recognised, and I was in a busy street. Everyone there was busy, but one particular woman was following me. I noticed her at first glance, but didn't pay much attention. She was fair with very dark eyes, but the whites of her eyes were totally black. She was bald and was wearing a blue sari, which is an Indian dress, and she knew my name. She called out to me, and when I looked back I could see she was running towards me, and that's when I woke up sweating and my heart was beating out of my chest. Now you might say that it was just a coincidence, but I then fell sick, and after that I had a viral fever cough and cold. I told my grandmother about it all, and she said it was a bad omen. But I was sceptical, and just put it down to being just a dream. However, last July I dreamt I could see myself sleeping. I stood there in disbelief, looking at myself asleep, when someone knocked at my door. I opened it and there was the bald woman from the street and this time she looked somewhat like a transgender person. I don't mean to offend anyone, I'm just trying to describe what I saw. She looked very angry, then pushed me aside and started pulling at my sleeping self, saying, Come with me, in a very deep voice. My sleeping self was still asleep, but I started pushing at the woman. She had a hold of me and tried dragging me out, and that's when my grandmother woke me up. I was sweating, and she told me that I had been screaming. She asked what had happened, so I told her. The following day I had terrible headaches, and it was hard for me to breathe. I took a Covid test and it came out positive, and thank God nothing happened to my grandparents. I recovered, though I feel scared to go to sleep sometimes. What if this time the bald woman takes me away? In Hinduism we believe in one's shadow. Some people have a strong shadow, 
and some are weak one. People with weak ones are easy to target by negative energy. And I have a weak shadow. I have had countless encounters like this. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed my video. And if you did, could you please give me virtual hugs by subscribing and clicking that notifications button. I also have a Patreon page and YouTube channel membership if you'd like to support me further. Thank you again for being here. Keep being creepy.